Well, good morning. This is a special time. In uh, November 1976, we started a home Bible study. There were five people in it uh, that was uh, familiar with the teaching of Pastor Chuck Smith, and they asked him if uh, they had somebody in Bellflower, and that's where I lived. And uh, Chuck called me in and said, do you want to do this study? And uh, I said, of course. And so it was started out with five people, and at the end of the year it was three. And so uh, <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> it was uh, a pleasure to get going by, uh, I think, 1977 then. I was... Uh, ordained, and uh, it, uh, the first year was really more about me than it was about them in the sense I was learning a lot about uh, the ministry and all of that, and uh, God's hand has been on it in such a great way, and I want to, this Thanksgiving, of course, is coming up, so I thought this would be a great time for several things. One is uh, a day of Thanksgiving for what God has done uh, with Hosanna, and quite frankly, in my life, personally, I usually don't do something just on me, but it's gonna be a lot about that connection because uh, the transference of senior pastor role is taking place, and that will happen in January with, uh, with Pastor Nathan, and uh, we're looking forward to that and what God is doing, but there's a season and a time for everything, and so I just wanna look at that uh, whole process of what God has done in, um, uh, in that uh, time span that we've had of 45 years of ministry, gone through the Bible eight times, verse by verse, and in the last year, we've done more topicals for a specific reason, and um, just looking forward to seeing more of uh, the same in the sense of reaching out, not just as a teacher, but as a pastor teacher, and that's why Nathan is a, uh, uh, been chosen for this role to take my place because there are, uh, there are a lot of teachers, excellent teachers, uh, and then there are pastor teachers. And there is a difference and there's a, a fullness in there that's not just about teaching the word, but how it relates in a sense to the flock that God has put you as an under shepherd uh, to minister to, to lead and to direct and to hear from God for the body in that sense. and. Um, it's just been my greatest privilege for uh, all these years to do that uh, with uh, the various people that have come through, not just these doors, but starting with the house and everything else that uh, been able to uh, share God's word with and encouragement and see so many wonderful things happen in their lives because of God's word. And to participate in that has always been a blessing. So what I wanna share with you, um, it relates so much to that, those events However, on the other hand, uh, to apply them to your own life, of your life over the last 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, I was talking about the years here and I mentioned something in here to Nathan, he says, I was 10 then. I said, okay, well, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> wherever you're at in the Lord, <laughs> to look back and, and, and use this as a week, because we have Thanksgiving come up, not just in general Thanksgiving, oh, it's Thanksgiving Day, let's have a turkey or a ham or whatever you're gonna do, but thankful of what God has done in your life, uh, because he was working in your life before you got saved. <laughs> and uh, to really give him thanks for those events and those things, and so I'll be sharing with you some of those things. Uh, the uh, place where I wanna begin is just that unusual scripture in Ecclesiastes 3, and that is where it just talks about all of the things in our lives wrapped up together. He makes a synopsis out of it. He says, for everything, in everything there is a season, and there's a time and a matter under heaven, and a time to be born, and a time to die. A time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sow. There's a time to keep silence, and there's a time to speak. There's a time to love, time to hate, Time for war and a time for peace. And uh, it just speaks of all seasons of life. And the real crux of the matter is the emphasis, that the concept behind all of it is look at your life and be thankful. 
to bring it back to your love relationship with the Lord and God's word, to obey his word, and be thankful in all these things. Whatever it's been, I give thanks for all things. The, um, uh, all the seasons of life that you look at um, have been a, a link in the chain of your life to, to put together things to bring you to where you're at today. Right? It has a purpose. Some of the things you don't like so much, but it's still part of who you are. In fact, some of the most painful things are the things that have made you strong, and uh, so too in my life. And to look at those, those events knowing God has directed your path, and to be thankful that. Maybe you got put in the belly of a whale for a while, you know, <laughs> but uh, it had a reason, a purpose, and a blessing from God. The... Um, uh, uh, the, the place for my thankfulness outside of knowing Christ, of course, is an obvious in the relationship with Jesus Christ, but um, is being married uh, to such a wonderful woman. Uh, we got married in 1965, and so uh, our last 56 years, uh, she's put up with a lot. <laughs> uh, mainly my uh, spontaneous ADD, if you will. Um, we got engaged about a year after high school. Uh, and I was working for a, a company selling pots and pans door to door, Aristocraft, stainless steel, uh, three ply. And uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, but I'd won a sales contest. We were engaged at the time, and I uh, won a sales contest. I sold my uh, Impala, actually, for the money to buy the ring. But uh, we, anyway, there's a sales contest, and I was one of the winners of the sales contest, and allowed me to go uh, for uh, a week to a con all expense uh, uh, paid trip for, I think it was Wis Wisconsin, was it? Yeah, Delview, Wisconsin. Uh, to a convention there for all the, the aristocraft people in the, in the country and the, the, the leaders and the directors and the top sales. And so uh, I was invited to go, and I thought, well, that would be a cheap honeymoon. So uh, <laughs> I, I told Denise, hey, look at all expenses paid. Why not? So two weeks later, uh, we got married, and uh, <laughs> the following week, we were off to Delview, Wisconsin. I remember telling her, her folks, you know, we're, we're getting married. Said, well, we, you know, you're gay. She said, no, in two weeks. <laughs> so it was interesting. Anyway, um, uh, but when we were coming back from the, uh, from the convention, uh, we were getting ready to buy the, uh, get the, the transfer tickets to go home. And uh, one of the managers uh, of the team that I was on said, well, where are you going from here? I said, going back home. He said, why don't you go someplace else? I mean, you go to San Francisco or something. I said, I've never been there. He says, well, here, let me. So he went up ahead of me and paid for first class tickets for us to go to San Francisco. I said, oh, great, let's go to San Francisco. No thought about anything else, let's go. So we're in the plane to San Francisco, and we're getting up and we're looking out at the picture, taking pictures. We're, I mean, we're 19 and 18. Uh, uh, I think I was 19, she was 18. And uh, uh, in those days, I had to get permission from my parents to get married because I wasn't 21. But if you're a girl and 18, you were considered an adult, which I think was appropriate difference. <laughs> but uh, uh, we get on the, I'll show you how naive we were. We get on the plane and uh, they said, would you like some drinks? Because federally, when you're in the airlines, you know, it's there's, there's not so uh, an age thing because every state is different. So they said, would you like some drinks? We, and uh, so you're naive. Uh, yeah, we'll have a cocktail. <laughs> the lady, <laughs> Stuart says, that's a type of, that's, a, let me bring you something. <laughs> we didn't have a clue. Um, but uh, we're taking pictures out the window of, you know, the, the Mississippi and different things, just whatever, and just having a good time. Well, these, uh, this one gentleman said, are you guys newlyweds? Yeah, how'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he says, where are you going, San Francisco? He says, oh, I'm from San Francisco. He's got a business there and everything else. 
He said, do you know where you're going? And we said, actually, no. He said, well, let me write you some directions. So he wrote about, it must have been 10 pages of notes of places to go, trolleys to take, exactly what to avoid, where to go, everything. Just a phenomenal man. Turned out to be the president of Beech Nut Gum. And um, so this other guy, was, uh, as he was writing, he started talking to us. And, um, and he said, well, when you arrive, he says, do you, have a, do you have a ride or anything? I said, no. And he says, well, I'll, I'll take you where you want to go to find a hotel or whatever. He was the president of uh, one of the bank's branches in San Francisco, B of A. And uh, uh, so God <laughs> obviously was watching out for us. And uh, we're, so we're driving around to hotels and we get to a, a hotel. He says, this is a nice one. It's affordable. I think you'd like it. So she stays in the car. I go in to, to check the hotel out. And she's thinking, I'm with this strange guy. I don't know anything about him. My, my new husband's in there, you know. I'm thinking, just naive, dumb. Um, but he, he was a great guy, and, and he gave us this card, and he said, anything happens here, you have any problems, you need a car, anything, you call my, my uh, bank branch, and if I'm not there, you just tell them whatever you need, you got it, and they'll take care of you. I said, wow, great. So, I mean, it was like, just everything was taken care of. And Beach Nut, the, the gentleman gave us, we, we knew what restaurants to eat at, where to avoid, it was just stuff we couldn't have planned. But God said, well, I wasn't a Christian, but just a sense that it's okay, it'll work out. Um, and then we're on the plane uh, going home and uh, flying along, and she says, uh, no, because I, I set up, made arrangements with her, with her family, you know, to do the wedding and everything else, let's do this, let's do that, okay. And... Um, so we're flying home, and she says, well, where are we going to stay? Where are we going to live? Uh, I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> and she's trusting me, just as naive as I was, but she was like, well, you're my husband. You'll take care of it, you know. Yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, we got home, and fortunately, my, uh, my folks... Uh, I'm, well, they raised me so they knew I was pretty ADD. So he had a rental. He had uh, uh, been vacated, and he so he and and uh, her dad re-roofed it and fixed it up. It was right in the parking lot. Actually, it was in the, the house in the parking lot right here uh, behind the church. And the reason it's a parking lot now is because they bought that house. <laughs> we made a parking lot of our very first home. But uh, so we got had a place to, to, to live and to get started. And um, then uh, we'd been married just a short time, uh, maybe two or three years or something like that. And uh, we, my dad had an upholstery shop, which is right next door with the, the toddler room and all that. That was my dad's upholstery shop. And uh, so we, we had a wholesale license, everything for furniture. So we go to the wholesale furniture place in Los Angeles, 12 stories high, and she looks through all the furniture to figure out what she wants. Took all day and finally picked out just what she wanted, had it ordered eight days or eight weeks before we received it. We finally receive it, and um, uh, <laughs> uh, I had a client that came in the store and was looking for some specific furniture. And I said, oh, I, I've seen that. Here, let me show you. And I showed him the furniture in our house because it's right behind the place, right? So, oh, this is wonderful. So I sold it to him. So <laughs> Denise comes home and uh, she's got a friend because I want you to see, you know, she's so proud of it, the furniture she's been waiting for for eight weeks, shop for all day in a 12-story building all these different kinds of furniture from all over the country. And uh, it was just modern, you know, the kind of what she wanted. And she opened the door and the house is empty because uh, I sold the furniture. Uh, <laughs> then about six months later, we had some, um, some new furniture uh, that uh, we had in the house and um, uh, we had moved to a different location by that time and that house was being bought by the city and torn down and all that, so we moved. Anyway, um, so we have furniture that fits that house. And I met this couple, uh, uh, John and uh, Mary Nutterville. And I started talking to him about stuff. And he said, well, I was a priest. And I said, I thought you couldn't get married. You know, what are you doing together? 
And I had no knowledge of religion, but I knew that, you know. And uh, she's a nun. He said, well, he said, I've left the, the ministry to marry her, and she's left the ministry, the, you know, her calling, because we really feel like it was the Lord, and we got married. He said, but we don't have anything. So I gave him the furniture. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Denise comes home again that day with some friends to <laughs> say, oh, yeah, we finally got our furniture for this house, you know. <laughs> Nothing there. <laughs> Uh, so I'm so thankful for her <laughs> that uh, she's always understood <laughs> and, uh, and been there for me. But um, next year, she was working at Phelps Dodge Copper Corporation and, uh, uh, on her job in the, the, the pizza place right here next to the church. Okay. Uh, that was just a, the people that had a little restaurant in there had left and my dad owned the property. And he says, hey, would you like to do something in there? And I says, like what? He says, well, you want to do a little restaurant or something in there? I'd never done anything like that before. I thought, of course me, right? Why not? So I call her and I said, hey, think of a name for a restaurant. Why? Well, because I just got one. And uh, <laughs> so she gave her notice and came home with the name Hungry Tummy. And, uh, you know, we see 300 people 30 at a time and we started a restaurant. We, we literally had to start from scratch, tearing it apart and fixing it up and everything else. And, I said, well, well, we'll do it for two years, and you know, uh, if it doesn't work out, we'll get out of it, and if it does, we'll sell it. Well, in two years, we sold it, and got some money, and she says, where are we going? What do you want to do? And I says, we'll go to Canada. How, well, where? I don't know. I was born there. It's north. They haven't changed it, and so we took off. <laughs> um, so that's, ladies, if you want to know what it's like to be married to, maybe you're married to somebody like me, and you know, but if you, her, uh, uh, yielding to my personality and everything else uh, really helped us succeed in 56 years of marriage. Um, uh, otherwise, I think after the first or second at the least <laughs> disposal of the furniture, <laughs> she would have disposed of me. Uh, but uh, I'm just so thankful for her, uh, her uh, belief in me and things worked out and then we got saved in 1973, and what I found is that faith is a gift that you have whether or not you're saved. God gives his faith, his gifts, and without repentance. And so some of the things we think are actually personality traits or whatever, in many cases, are gifts that you have for mercies, to hospitality and other things. And when you get saved, you have a purpose for it. But prior to that, it's just something you, you, just, you, just, you just do it because it's part of who you are. And so we got saved and I realized that, that now that sense of trust that I had in, uh, in, in you know, just the world around me and everything else and some kind of idea that somehow it was just gonna all work out, now my trust was in God. But my, it didn't diminish, it just accelerated my uh, relationship with, the, with, with that gift and the Lord to just do whatever God told me to do. If it was go to uh, Istanbul, if it was to go to uh, Morocco, or go to, we, with uh, Pastor Emil Haddad, um, the Ambassadors for Peace, said, so, we need to get this message to the Muslims that they should be able to read the Bible. If we can read the Quran, they should be able to read the Bible. Well, let's go see Sheikh Muhammad Tintawi, the head of 776, uh, 86 million Muslims and Sunnis. It's like saying, let's go see the Pope. Well, a month later, we were sitting down with him, spent two hours talking about him for peace. <laughs> I don't know how. It just, we believed. And uh, wherever, whatever sense you have in your relationship, like I said, if it's hospitalities or mercies or whatever it might be, or faith, you, you, have that grow, you have that in your life and then you get saved. Now you have a reason for it, a purpose for it. Um, the, uh, I got a call from um, a friend of ours, or we're now saved and, and um, trying to sort out God's calling on my life and, and 
being involved in the ministry beyond what I was doing in the church at Costa Mesa, and I, you know, just different things and prayer ministries and stuff that I was involved in. And got a call from um, uh, Susie Reynolds, and she was with Campus Crusade, and she said, uh, would you go see my brother? He's in the hospital, he's been shot. The, the uh, uh, waitress, he's the manager of a restaurant, the, the waitress that was with him was killed, and uh, he was shot and a bullet went into his head and he lost his eyesight, and he's, he looks like he's gonna be paralyzed, and we're not sure if he's gonna make it through the night. And I said, sure, so I went to the hospital, and just believing God's word, you know, what it says. So I walked past the doctor and I was gonna go pray for him and he goes, excuse me, who are you? And I said, well, I'm a, a minister, a gospel of Jesus Christ. The sister asked me to come and pray for him. He goes, well, hurry up, would you? He says, we've got some stuff to get done. And I, I, I said, yeah, it won't take long. And I talked to Mike and he was, couldn't see and he was failing, and I just taught, you know, said, I know you know the gospel because your brother, your sister's a campus crusade. Would you like to receive Christ? And he said, uh, yeah, you know. And uh, so he prayed, and when I got done praying, I said, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. And God gave me a word, and I turned to the doctor, and I said, he's gonna see, he's gonna have his optical nerves back, and he's gonna walk in three months. He said, oh, get out of here. Well, that's exactly what happened. My grandma's is still alive today. When I look back on it and I think, were you nuts? <laughs> I mean, this doctor is going, get out of here, and then I'm telling him exactly what's gonna happen. The only reason I did it is a gift of faith, of God saying, I've, did I speak to you? Yeah, well, tell him. And God confirmed it. But what happened uh, on the flip side of that when I went there, I realized that he, uh, the, the, the police were there and they said, we don't know, this guy came up and it was a, it was a hit. And he said, we don't know why or what, but you, we can't continue to watch him beyond this day, so can, if you can provide some people to watch him. And I said, I will, so I called home and I told Denise, I said, I'm gonna be in the hospital for a week <laughs> watching this guy. And she didn't blink an eye. She said, okay, you're gonna need to change your clothes. <laughs> so. Uh, this Thanksgiving, uh, I, I, for giving thanks, I'd like to make it, uh, like I said, personal for you, as it is personal for me, and personal for Hosanna, of giving thanks of specific things in your life that you can look back and say, well, God's hand was in that. I could have gone left, I went right, I could have gone straight, I turned around went the other way, I did this, I did that, I waited, I moved, whatever it was. Um, you know, even, even some of the silly things, you just see that um, uh, to be thankful for those happy memories, those kind of quirky things. When we were in San Francisco, we got on the bus to, to go to see the Gold Gate Bridge, and we're riding along, riding along, and we're going over this huge bridge, and oh, wow, and everything else, we're riding along, right? Pretty soon, the whole is stopping at all these other places. The whole day goes by, and he, the bus driver pulls in at the end of the day to the lot, and he looks in his mirror and, ah, what are you doing here? Why are you still here? Well, we're going to the Golden Gate Bridge. He says, I drove over it. <laughs> well, we didn't know. He says, well, you're supposed to pull the cord and the bus stops. We didn't know, and he's like, oh. <laughs> so he gave us a pass to get home. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you look at things that sometimes just seem not consequential at all, but they're just for good memories, just, you know, another way. Uh, later on, we realized well, God was still directing our path and provided, and it's okay, here's your ticket home, don't worry about a thing, you know. Um, the, uh, uh, the calling for, uh, for Hosanna, uh, started one morning in the house on Belmont Street, which is where we moved to, after we moved to this other one, we moved back over there. And, um, and you can see it, it's the first house on the corner on Belmont, right behind us here. And I, with the Bible study was growing and I prayed and I said, Lord, I just don't know if I'm supposed to continue to do this, is this what you want for my future? And I looked up and I saw 
the sunrise, and it was an Easter morning, and if you'll see uh, on the corner, I think it's up there, yeah, on that side there, that's the church. It's the theater at the time. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, it's yours. Well, that just answered a lot of questions. It wouldn't be mine just so I could have an empty theater, <laughs> you know. And um, that was the beginning of God's promise for what he was going to do with Hosanna in provisions and everything else. Um, and I look at that and I just thank the Lord for his grace and um, his provision because he fulfilled his promise. He answered uh, his promise to me and uh, I've had 45 years of fellowship with not a building but with people. <laughs> with uh, the church, not the sanctuary, but with the church, the people. Uh, different families and uh, different individuals and just God's hand upon their lives, watching their lives get changed, watching them get transformed, done everything from funerals to weddings and you know everything in between and graduations and all sorts of things that come up, uh, troubled marriages and counselings and uh, the joy of the new birth of a child and, and uh, in some cases the burial of a child and some very difficult moments and just walking through it with individuals in their life and uh, new marriages and divorces and new beginnings and just everything you can possibly imagine. As a pastor, you, you're a part of that in people's lives. And uh, it has just been such a blessing that um, uh, the people of Hosanna, the church, in other words, uh, to this very day have been a people of peace, of joy, and of love, no matter what the trials. And um, it's, it's just the, uh, something that I give thanks for, of uh, the relationship that is here with the body of Christ. In um, uh, 1 Timothy, uh, it says, I, and I, I apply this to my own life, but he says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, uh, insolent uh, opponent. I used to debate Christians all the time. I just got a kick out of it. And, uh, um, you know, kind of went after them at, at, if they spoke up at school or anything like that. I was, a, you know, an agnostic. But um, uh, he says, I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly, ignorantly in unbelief, which is what an agnostic uh, is, is just a person of ignorance. And uh, I was just totally ignorant about religion and relationship with God or any of that. Um, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. I know it's absolutely God's grace. So for all of the seasons, uh, of my seasons collectively, they reveal who we are to uh, make us who we can be in Christ. And I know that applies to you, uh, to be thankful for those things and those events that have happened and make this, this Thanksgiving meal and this Thanksgiving week uh, really a time of personalizing it for you, not just general thanks, uh, but look at your life and what God has done is how, and what he's prepared you for and provided you for. And December, uh, though this is my, you know, the uh, final uh, Bible study uh, for me as, as a senior pastor, because Pastor Nathan's gonna take that in January, we'll be doing December 15th, I think. 5th or 15th? 5th. Uh, and it's gonna be about you and your role in the ministry, what you're doing, because whether or not you know it, you are part of the ministry. Even people that don't know they're doing it are doing it. <laughs> And I want to share with you on that. But other than that, next year it'll just be as the Lord leads uh, for different things. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, but I'll be available, of course. Um, Matthew 6, uh, I'm just so blessed with and thankful for because God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. Has God given you a word five years ago? 10 years ago, if he gave it to you, he raimed it, he spoke it to your heart, he will keep it. Now he's gonna keep his word anyway, but there are some times where it's just, no, this is for you right now. Uh, he keeps his word. 
In Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 25, he says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. So I was you know, trying to figure out my life and everything else and what was happening when I got saved. And he just, he says, don't be anxious about it. Uh, don't, worry, don't even worry about what you eat. When we got saved, we walked away from all of our friends, jobs, everything, and we started just like we did when we got married. We had nothing. And he says, but don't worry about it. God, I took care of you then. You didn't even know me. I'll take care of you now. Don't worry about what you eat or what you drink or about your body. What you'll put on it is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. So just applying the faith, the hope, uh, that I had in the world and for the world and of the world, now I realized that my trust had to be in Christ. And if I did that, I had not just a sense of what could happen, but an assurance of what God was going to do, not what I was going to do or expecting anybody else to do. He says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? I read that scripture, looked out the window of our kitchen, and there was a tree, an avocado tree, didn't have any birds in or anything, and two sparrows flew over and perched in there, and they were there till the day we left the house, which was like a year or so later. They, they raised their family there and everything else. We saw, saw the whole process, and, and the little, little babies coming out of the the nests and holding on and learning to fly and everything, but it was just a reminder. He said, don't I take care of these birds? Just don't worry. And we went through some tough times. Everybody does. And I just go back to those birds and say, well, I got, you know, <laughs> took care of them. Here I am. <laughs> the, um, uh, he says, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? Some of you know my testimony, I'm not gonna go over the whole thing again, but um, you know, when about six months old and put in the hospital and 65 babies died that day and they expected me to be just one more of the number uh, in Vancouver and um, uh, God spared me. But the reason of God's influence of this, I found out later on there were five women that were praying. One of them's name was Irene Kitchen and I had the opportunity to meet her 40 years later. and. She told me the story, and she told my mother the full story, because my mother wasn't a believer. But they knew about me and my family through an extended family member who told them that I was in the hospital. They didn't even know me. But they prayed, they said, Lord, heal this child. Lay your hand upon him and heal him. If you don't, we know he'll be with you. But if you do, give him a heart for you. Oh, sorry. And, <clears throat> and a heart to serve in the ministry. I want to encourage you. When God brings somebody to your attention and says, hey, pray for this kid. Pray for these people. You don't even know him. There's a little kid in the hospital someplace. Pray for him. Prayer isn't powerful, but God is. And you exercise that power and that influence because God has ordained prayer to be the tool and the method by which we communicate with him for miracles. Now, he can do them outside of it, but I don't see anywhere in the Bible where that happens. <laughs> There's always somebody that God has raised up, even sometimes a Noah or a Jonah, and has them get involved in other people's lives just simply through prayer. So don't underestimate your influence in that person's life even 40 years later. He's, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your lifespan? 
We can't change that. There's an appointed time, an hour, and nobody knows what it is and when. I mean, I could have died as a child, and a lot of you have gone through things where car accidents and other things, and it's just the grace of God you're alive, or cancer, or other things. Um, I have Gilbert's uh, syndrome. I have, um, um, Jan Bray also, plus uh, multiple myeloma. Basically, my blood is always fighting. <laughs> something and uh, uh, so but you either die healthy or you die sick so uh, it's a reality that we all face I'm looking more at retirement in that sense not be, not just because there's some physical uh, issues to deal with and and stuff like that but more what's good for Hosanna uh, what's good for the life of Hosanna and for the life of Hosanna is is to have a pastor prepared for the work of the ministry and then be able to hand that baton off while I'm here to see the fruit of that and make it a good transition because I see too many churches that don't do that. And then it's like, who's this guy, you know? <laughs> and uh, uh, I didn't want to do that. And I've always been preparing somebody, but I know that I know that uh, Nathan is called of God. Uh, he has a pastor's heart for Hosanna and he's powerful teacher and preacher, and, um, and he's also able to understand the technology and everything else that it's available and speaks the language for the next generation, so it, uh, it, it, there's a connectivity in all of those things, and I'm blessed to see the doors open for that. Um, some people just ask me, well, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. I, I know what I've got. I know it has a term limit and all of that, you know, but I'm not going to be anxious for it because it's not going to change anything, is it? Uh, and, I, and I'm praying for healing, on the other hand. So, uh, you know, see what God does. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Uh, but seek first. And this has been a key scripture for me and for all the people of Hosanna from the beginning. Seek first. Seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things these things will be added to you. God cares about the stuff that you need. He'll take care of it. Uh, you know, I used to just go here and do that and get a job here or there, or whatever it was, whatever I thought I needed, but I got saved. I started praying, do you want me to go to work for this company or that company, open the door, what should I do? And God ordered my steps for the companies and the places where he wanted me to be. And it was a matter of, of prayer though. God, where do you want me? What do you want me to do? Um, and sometimes there's a cost to that. Uh, I've been working for a man, a very wealthy real estate individual, many offices and all of that. And uh, I was getting ready. Uh, this time when Mike Reynolds thing had happened, uh, I said, Lord, I'll, I'll go full time when I, when I can no longer spend the appropriate time with my work and I'm using their money for the ministry. So I went to my boss and I told him, and he says, no problem. And I finally, there was a whole week, you know, and uh, he says, well, it was the best week you've ever had. <laughs> so God took care of the sales job anyway, the, the insurance company I was with. But um, uh, I just, uh, uh, knew at that point that I was called to the ministry. This realtor called me to his office just by chance, uh, in a sense, <laughs> and he said, can I talk to you about something? I used to work for him. He said, I want you to work for me. I want you to head up this division, do this, this, and this. And I said, well, honestly, I know you don't really understand this, but I've become a Christian, and I know uh, over the years, you know, uh, so many things have changed, and uh, I appreciate the offer, but I, I can't do it because I'm going to go for Well, what are you going to get paid there? I says, right now, nothing. I put money in the bank to give me a, a head start because I don't know if it, how God's going to do it. But, you know, I can eat. Uh, but as far as pay right now, nothing. You know, I just know I'm supposed to do it. We had about, you know, 100 people in the body or something like that. And he, uh, just, you know, go ahead and do it. And he says, Handed me a blank check. I said, fill in the amount. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? He says, 
I doubt that you could make it big enough to make it be a problem for me. Just how much do you want? I say, I can't. I, I know what I'm called to do. And it has nothing to do with money. It has to do with the calling. Well, interestingly enough, a couple of years later, the building that we were in, uh, I felt like the Lord told us to buy it, which was good because later on we sold that and that gave us the money to buy this. But um, I went to him to buy it and he says, it's not for sale, it's an inheritance for my kids. And I said, oh, okay. And so I went home and prayed and I said, God, I, I really thought you told me to ask him to buy it. I meant we were gonna buy it. So can whatever it takes, bring a conviction to him or whatever, I know he's a believer, but uh, I don't know where to go from here, but I'm just gonna wait. Well, the next day, or maybe three days later, no, relatively fast, he came into my office and just trembling, literally. And he's not that kind of guy. I'm going, what's going on? He's, I, uh, you know that scripture where it says, the guy that goes and says, oh, my barns are full, and uh, be, be satisfied, soul, I'm doing fine, you know? He said, God spoke to him that night, and he says, you fool, this day, your, your soul is required of you. And he said, would you buy my building? <laughs> And I just thought, wow, Lord. You know, it, in other words, if I would have had that blank check, I, would have, I could have used it to buy the bill. It's like God says, don't worry about a thing. <laughs> because you do what I say, I'm going to give you what you need, and you don't even have to be involved in it. He keeps his word. One of the key scriptures for me, and I, and I hope it is for you as time goes on, if it isn't already, but it's in Deuteronomy 11, and ironically, in the Old Testament. And you think, well, Old Testament, you know, most promises are directly to Israel, and usually they are. But there are some nuances about scriptures where you say, well, this, this is a general scripture because it, it, it's complemented in the New Testament, not just about Israel, but where Jesus would quote it and talk to the nations or the Gentiles. Well, in Deuteronomy 11, it says, you shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today. That, and here's the commandment of God, Old Testament, right? Be strong, go in and take possession of the land that you're going over to possess. In other words, I've told you you can have it, go get it. Here's a picture of the, the theater uh, shortly after we got it. And uh, I, you can, oh, where is it? there you go. But it had the old signpost and it was called the Holiday. Prior to that, it was the new bill. And uh, the city had it for 10 years and it had been uh, just vacant and demolished inside. and. It was so bad when we came in here to get it, to, after we bought it from the city, uh, I had about a, a third of the board and maybe as many as, as half of the elders left. They said, you're crazy. It looked so bad, it was so terrible. They looked up around at everything and the cement walls and the big orchestra pit here that had been dug out and the whole thing was just absolutely a shambles and vandalized uh, over a 10 year period, you can imagine. And they could, I looked at it and thought, oh, God gave it to us, okay. You know, <laughs> and they said, you're nuts. You know, we're not gonna give you any money to, we're not gonna tie it to this, are you crazy? And so they left. And the ones that stayed were faithful, obviously. Uh, we got through it and God blessed and God answered his, prayer, his uh, word to us. But uh, he said, so just be strong because you're gonna go over and possess it. The land that you were going over to possess, because we were across the street. So when he gave me the scripture, we were on Edenmore, and he says, you're gonna cross over the street and I'm gonna give you the land. And it reminded me of the picture that I took when he said, I've given this to you. And I thought, oh, okay. So I went right to the city, said, we wanna buy this. And they said, no, and eight years later, we were able to get it. So sometimes the timing is the Lord, it's not, you know, not ours. But anyway, the land that you're going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys and drinks water by the rain of heaven, a land that you, the Lord your God cares for. Of course, in Peter, it says, God cares for you. And he says, the eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. In other words, no matter what's going on during the year, hills and valleys and everything else, he's gonna take care of things, don't worry about it. And if you, you know, they come by and they do earthquake tests all, all the time and they drill and they go, well, it still exceeds the standards, you know. <laughs> it's got rebar every, one and a half, every 12 inches or 18 inches or something like that and it's, it's everything from 12 to three feet thick in some places and all this other stuff and they keep going, oh. You know, uh, but he says, I'll watch over it. And if you will indeed obey my commandments, the Old Testament, right? 
that I command you today, and here's his commandments, love God. <laughs> love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Does that sound like the New Testament or what? You know, we, sometimes people will go back to the Old Testament, they get under dietary laws and all these other kind of rules and regulations. Okay, I gotta buy it, be the commandments. Jesus said, here's the commandments, love God and love your neighbors yourself. It's basically what he's saying here, just love God and, <laughs> and serve him with all your heart and soul. That's it. <laughs> you know, you don't have a bunch of do's and don'ts and all, just love God. The, uh, uh, the Lord wants to give you all things that you need. So seek him first, his righteousness, all the other things he'll take care of. Just put him first in your life. What do you want to do, God? And he'll take care of the rest. Love him. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was thankful for Deuteronomy 11, 11, even before I really understood all the hills and valleys and what that meant but I was sure that he was gonna keep his word about that and seek first the kingdom because of Psalms 23, which he had already kept his word, and that's how I got saved, by remembering a scripture I memorized once when I was nine years old, and when I was stoned out of my mind, it came back to me and brought sobriety in a new beginning, and I got saved. <laughs> so I knew he kept his word. The Lord is my shepherd. In fact, he's always been, you know, didn't even know it. Uh, I shall not want, in other words, don't be anxious because he'll take care of it. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Sometimes it's with a rod and a staff. Get over there by the still waters. <laughs> you know, he restores my soul. You know, life, the world, the devil, the flesh, it all eats away at your soul. It attacks uh, everything, the substance of who you really are but God restores. And whatever it is that's attacked you, your soul, your very person, not just your, your physical body of ailments or other things, or the surroundings where you live or don't live, but attacked who you are to the point where you just don't feel like even living, maybe suicide, God restores your soul. Your soul belongs to him, don't let the devil have it. He paid for it with his blood. Just give it all over to him, and he'll restore you. I will fear no evil, no, and then he says, um, you walk in the path of righteousness for his name's sake, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I've, you know, I walked through many with the shadow of death in their families, their own personal lives. Um, I know I'm gonna go through it in my life, everybody does but that it's a shadow, and you have a shadow because the sun is shining against something that produces a shadow. The shadow is just that, it's a shadow of reality. Death has no sting, it has no power. For you to get to the light on the other side is the destination and the process is the valley which creates the shadow of death. It's not anything that has any power over you and I've, I've seen enough people uh, in that situation and the joy of the Lord, and sometimes in the last breath where there's this peace that passes all understanding, and they wouldn't come back if, <laughs> if they had the chance. And even some that do, and they go, why, why did you pray for me? <laughs> you know, so it's just a shadow of death. I will fear no evil for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now the rod and the staff were used as discipline, but it's a comfort when you know God loves you enough to discipline you. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. It all comes from God. It's just a matter of uh, Submitting your will to him and just saying, Lord, here I am. You know, talk, talks about in Luke uh, 11, uh, to ask for the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. The anointing oil, uh, it's, it's, a, 
It's an oil of strength, of peace, of joy, and of the substance of who God is, not who we are. So the physical concept of oil drenching you, you know, people go, boy, that's a guy's got oil all over him, you know? It's the idea, it's not you anymore, it's him, it's his power, it's his authority, it's what he wants to do. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I've, I've prayed with people that, you know, their families are bankrupt physically, morally, uh, healed, seen them heal financially, heal morally, heal uh, in so many ways. People that have been uh, molested, uh, people that are the abusers, um, the gangster, prostitute, uh, business owner, uh, all sorts of people, laborers, executives, the unemployed, handicapped, the single moms, um, and single dads now, more and more of that. But the, um, to bring them to a place of being blessed through thanksgiving for what God was doing. Uh, to see that power and that joy that comes to a life that is totally fallen apart, torn apart by the world, the devil, and the flesh, and watching goodness and mercy follow because they've simply given the word and the fellowship of prayer and the anointing of God in their life to hand that over to them and let them know it's, it's okay. It's okay, God understands. God's been with you through it all. You survived it for a reason. Now comfort others with the comfort you've been comforted with. Your testimony has a purpose. It has a plan so that you can effectively minister to other people. That the gospel is much bigger than each one of us. It is all of us together in Christ that minister to others into a sick and dying world that has no hope without Christ. None. Right? They can't get vaccinated for salvation. <laughs> that what is needed is their relationship with Jesus Christ, like you have, so share with them. And then in Malachi, it says, will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the, full, the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put, put this is the only place where the Bible says, test me says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out down upon for you a blessing until there is no more need and I will rebuke the devourer for you so that I will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations shall call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts, Malachi 3. Uh, to me, that meant something personal that the moment we got saved, we started giving, and God started giving back, and I just watched one miracle after another. But also, I just want you to know, maybe you're not fully aware of what Hosanna does, because uh, I've kept that, that kind of concept in my mind. Um, lifeguard, food ministry, is a result of that, of saying we want to tie to the community, in a sense, give back to the community. Whether they're saved or not, if they're hungry, they're hungry, and be able to minister to them. And uh, Jimmy Stachias, who's just such a blessing, I, I went to him and said, I've got an idea, and he was an old produce guy. And I said, what do you think? He goes, ah, it won't work. The next day he came back and he goes, well, God told me to do it. <laughs> and uh, God's been blessing it ever since. And um, it, it, we've ministered to over 32 other ministries. The food comes in, it goes out. Um, we don't charge for it. God doesn't charge us for it. We freely receive, we freely give. And the businesses that we work with are glad. They're happy. They rejoice. They celebrate what we do because they know uh, it's with integrity. And then uh, Samaritan's Purse, of course, which we've always been a part of, and, and you have been in the giving of those things. We've, we, we've just been a part of it for so many years. We're so thankful for the Graham family and Franklin Graham and Billy Graham's preaching at Franklin's with the uh, Samaritan's Purse. And, and from that, we developed a friendship with... Uh, uh, William, and uh, to have him here again, I'm just looking forward to that. He's really a neat brother. But, the, but Samaritan's Purse has been a part of that. And now, just so you know, Operation Blessing has a great ministry to orphans around the world that uh, they're orphans now because of COVID. So one, the beginning of the week, 
uh, they woke up, they had a, a father or mother, and, and by the end of the week, they don't have either, and they're orphans. And there's over a million and a half of them that they're documented that, that need help. And um, we, we usually get a lot of, you know, uh, Christmas gifts and stuff. We have, uh, you know, adopt a child, adopt a family, and like that. And so we have resources for that, but we, we have uh, uh, so much more than we need to do and fulfill all the needs of the family. Instead of just buying more gifts, so let's do something special. So we sent $1,000 uh, to, yeah, so Santa's money to, uh, to, to the Operation uh, Blessing or, for Orphans. And uh, just to, you know, for us in this country, that would be like about forty or fifty thousand dollars, as far as what it, what a thousand dollars can do uh, to minister to them. And and for some kids, it's going to be you know get a toy and get something like that. And for a lot of them, it's just going to get the health care, the food, and the, the substance that they're going to need that somebody cares about them. And um, but anyway, that that comes from my understanding of what God says: when you give to the poor, uh, you loan to the Lord. So, uh, just in your own life, if you're not doing that, if you're not giving, you're missing some blessings. It's not like he's demanding it and has a heavy hand with you. He just says, this is a, a thing that, that he's ordained, that you give, he gives back, you get more, you give more, he gives back more. And, you know, there's a whole relationship there that, that builds a community. It has built so much of America, quite frankly, of uh, so many of the th institutions and hospitals and everything that we have come from that kind of concept. But, and then in Zechariah chapter, um, in fact, there was a, uh, I was going to spend some money, though, on remodeling the church, and I, I, this is kind of the design I got for it, and then I thought, nah. <laughs> I thought, man, nah, maybe we should just give the money away and <laughs> Keep the remodeling is simple anyway. Anyway, uh, uh, Zechariah 4, 6 through 7, he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, a great mountain before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. And he shall bring forward the top stone with, amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Um, you know, it, it's just God's provision of grace. God's richness at Christ's expense. God's grace for you. You don't deserve it. Uh, we, he just gives it to you. All I have to do is receive it. Uh, we're, we're used to getting something uh, you know, for something we do, it's a birthday present, or because you've, you know, you've been 25 years someplace and they give you a gold watch or whatever, and uh, because it, 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 it's something you've done. And in fact, the church wanted me to have a, a small medal, uh, and so, <laughs> I just, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, but the, the rewards that we have, we don't even deserve because everything we do in Christ is because of his grace. It's kind of like a child when you hear, go, you know, go buy something for your mother. I don't have any money. Here's some money. What do you want to get? I want to get that. Okay, but you wrap it in there. Give it to, give it to mom. Oh, thank you. Oh, loves, hugs, and kisses. And you, spa you paid for it. You know, that's God's grace. He provides. And... Um, he says that, that uh, well, I'll just give you an example. Um, there was a, a girl that uh, came into the church one time. She just looked disheveled and she was talking too fast and just acting strange. And um, this guy came up to tell her to come home. He says, you come with me. Well, I realized he was the pimp. She was trying to get out of the lifestyle and I uh, said, no, you, no, 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 she's not going with you. No, oh, you and who else, you know. So I called three of the biggest guys in the churches. Each one of them is over six foot two. Uh, put them in the back seat, put two of them on the one side and the one in the front with his arm hanging over. It's about that big around, you know. And I uh, said, no, you're not coming back, I guarantee you. And he's just like, ah, what? You know, so drove him up to Signal Hill. 
dropped them off, and, and uh, they said, you will not come back. And he, and he said, uh, what are you gonna do? What, what do you mean, you know? And they said something like, well, we'll just kill you and tell God you died. They said, you're Christians. And they said, look, we're not messing around. We're, you don't, we're new, we don't put up with pimps. You wanna repent, give your life to Christ? No, well then don't ever come back. Don't go near that girl. Well, we never saw him again. Um, pray he gets saved, but you know, not at her expense in that sense. So uh, we ministered to her and she just seemed like she was having such a trouble. I thought, something's physically wrong. So I took her to the doctor on the boulevard, a friend of mine at the time, he's, he's with the Lord now, and I said, would you take a look at her, you know? So he, he comes back out and, uh, and he said, yeah, he says, I, I think she's just winding down from uh, meth. That was the first understanding I, I had of what meth could do and all of that. And, um, and he says, I've, I've given her a shot that'll calm a lot of that down and she should be okay. Well, all of a sudden she goes running out the front door. She's taken off the robe that he'd given her got nothing on, and she's running down Belfort Boulevard. So I started to go for the door to run out, and he goes, uh, I wouldn't do that if I was you. And he says, pastor chasing a naked girl down Belfort Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So we prayed, and pretty, she came back. He put her clothes on her, and uh, she came back to the office and prayed with her. She gave her life to Jesus Christ. Uh, that guy never came back to see her. She grew in the Lord for about two years at Hosanna. She met a young man. They got married. They moved to the Midwest, and she's got three kids and loves God. Yeah. Um, grace. Grace. You know, there's nobody beyond his reach. And um, if I was a non-believer, <laughs> it wouldn't have gone so well for the pimp. <laughs> it was God's gracie. <laughs> we just drove him someplace. <laughs> but uh, in, uh, finally in, in John, uh, uh, John chapter 15, it says, if you keep my commandments, and this was a word that God had given me of how to walk in the spirit and walk in the love. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just follow what God says, you'll abide in his love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, I, to abide in his love, I would just put it this way. Live and give grace, mercy, when necessary, sacrifice your own needs for theirs, and give forgiveness. If you do that, you're gonna abide in God's love. These things, he says, I've spoken to you that, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Now the love one another term in the Greek literally doesn't mean like, okay, I'm gonna show you my, my love or God's love towards you. No, love one another, there's such a connection in it, it's saying we agree that we're going to love one another. So collectively, when something happens, another will say, Hey, you know, you guys shouldn't be dealing with it this way. You still love one another. There's just a, a connection in the body of Christ that there's an agreement that the end result of whatever's happening and stuff happens, come on, we're, we're, we're gonna love one another. We're gonna work through this. And you go back to 1 Corinthians 13 for the definition. But these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you. Your joy may be full. Greater love has no one than this, verse 13, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. You wanna have a friendship with God? Just do what he tells you. <laughs> no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does, does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me. And this one just, hit me when I started going into the ministry and realized God had me in sales and I was, I was working with a company that I would go from real estate office to real, real estate office. I was working in um, uh, land insurance and so I would go there. And, and both there and then when I worked for a restaurant, a multiple chain restaurant, that um, uh, I was working with different people. But in both of those places, 
there were young ladies that I was able to lead to the Lord and they left their lifestyle, put it that way, <laughs> and people taking advantage of them. And um, it, it just astounded me to watch the transformation uh, of people's lives, uh, business owners that would treat people different, uh, employees that would serve different, all of that and the morality and everything else. And I was just, God, what? this is amazing, because it's just like people go, can I talk to you about something, what? And I find myself talking, and there are 10 people at the company listening, you know? And he says, because I've chosen you to do this. He says, when we had the, when we were working on the, the building here and painting it, and it just, it really looked bad, it was just cement. And so we thought, well, we'll just paint the cement. And the guy came to the church, and he, and he was coming here for some time, uh, um, Jack DeVore, I think his name was. And he, yes, and he said, uh, he said, can I help with something? And I said, well, what do you want? He said, well, I can't teach, and I don't communicate too well with people, and I, I, not a lot of stuff I can do, but I can stucco. I said, well, let's stucco a corner over here. He goes, no, I mean, I can do the whole building. Really, and the reason why we have a stucco building that looks decent is because of him. That's his ministry. Now, he was chosen to do that. And he's just a servant of the Lord, and it has been, you know, until he went to be with the Lord, uh, with that relationship. He works hard and everything else, but then he takes the abundance of that and says, hey, what can I do to help? You know, and, um, but I was chosen uh, to teach the word. And I, that's when I realized it, because he says, look, you didn't cho choose me. You know, I've chosen you, and I've appointed you. And we're gonna talk about that December 5th, of where you're at and what your calling is, don't underestimate it. He says, um, appointed you and chosen you to go and bear fruit, that your fruit should, should abide, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Um, and I asked for an Ephesians 5 marriage after a marriage that had been broken apart, uh, after seven years of marriage, and in the last, you know, now we've been married 56 years plus, and I think God, has answered that prayer. Um, the, uh, to finish the course, I was a person that would start things and not complete them, and when I, when I said, okay, I'm going to take this step, forget the money, I'm gonna take the step and minister in the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, but I ask one thing from you, Lord, that by your spirit I'm able to f finish it. <laughs> and not go, ooh, let me do that. <laughs> so I think 45 years is, uh, uh, an accomplishment of grace in my life more than you know. <laughs> These things I command you that you will love one another. And again, that's talking about a relationship with Christ that you agree. And so whether it's a friend that you have, whether it's, um, you know, if you're single and you're, you have, you know, a friendship, but you want to be safe, you know, sexually and all of that stuff, you know, when you say, look, we agree to love one another. In other words, we're going to watch out for each other. You don't have to, you know, you know, where's this person gonna go? What are they gonna try? No, let's just start off with that. That's not gonna happen. Because, you know, we, we really do care about each other. And in marriage, the same thing. Well, let's start this argument with, we, we love each other. Let's start with that. You know, not <laughs> why the furniture sold. <laughs> anyway, uh, to, <laughs> to conclude, um, this is for the next generation. This is for Nathan and the, the, and the work of the ministry in his life and my uh, place with him and where I'm at now and what's happening. And, and it's, it, this is a, a very, those, anybody here retiring or recently retired or you're getting retired? Half a dozen or so, yeah. It's difficult, it's weird because everything you've done for the last 25 or my case 45 years, you know, that was your future. Now my future is behind me. <laughs> you know, it's all about what I'm not doing now instead of what I'm doing. This is a weird thing. But anyway, I kind of get a sense of where Paul was coming from when he, when he wrote this. I charge you, because now he's charging Timothy as I would charge um, Nathan. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort uh, with complete patience and te 
<clears throat> and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And more and more, the closer we get to the return of the Lord, the more evident that is becoming. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And because the relationship of teaching uh, doesn't leave out evangelism, but the teaching is to feed the flock because sheep beget sheep. But as you feed the flock, you still do the work of evangelism, and so he's reminding him of that. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Um, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Uh, the ch church gave me this instead. No, I just. Uh, <laughs> I got this from uh, Chuck Messler, actually. <laughs> Which uh, the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Think about that. I mean, I can read this and mean it in my heart, but when you read that Paul wrote this, and he wrote 90% of the New Testament, and he says, but here's the point. That righteous judge is going to award me. He knew, you know, you're, you're saved by grace and you get to heaven. There's no, there's nothing you've done to get you a reward for heaven. Heaven's a gift. But what happens in heaven? What happens in the millennium? Those are rewards of what you do for all eternity. It's based on what you do here. It's like my handwriting is terrible because I didn't learn in high school. Grade school even. Uh, you know, stuff will, sticks with you forever, right? Uh, but henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward me, reward you on that day. And he says, not only to me, here's Paul saying this, but also to all who have loved his appearing. If you're looking for the return of the Lord, if your life uh, no matter how tough it gets sometimes, you go, I know the Lord could come back this minute. Why am I so worried about this? If you're looking for his appearing, you're looking for the return of the Lord, is you're going to get the same rewards that Paul got. Lord Jesus, come quickly. <laughs> you know, it is time for the next generation. Things are happening so fast in a technological world and so many things that are changing so quickly, and to be able to enter into that as we have been in transition over the last three years, everything from the live streaming and all the other stuff and the way that you communicate now, you know, is, as you know, is just so completely different. It's one thing to pick up uh, uh, Instagram or Facebook or whatever and use it. It's another thing to know how it works and implement it to get the word out, and that's a whole other thing that, that uh, Nathan is able to accomplish, and so. Uh, to those that are watching uh, online, uh, Nathan knows how to expand that and any, any avenues you have, get a hold of him. He'll, I'm sure he can, he can work with you. Um, it is time for Nathan to shepherd the flock and I will be pastor emeritus, which means I am a founding pastor and hold the the title, if you will, of senior pastor, but he is the senior pastor beginning in January and we'll lay hands on him and pray for him as a body. And uh, I will be here, uh, but uh, it'll be as the Lord shows me to do, you know, study here or there, whatever, whatever, you know, uh, Nathan is looking for what's happening, but the transition is necessary now. And uh, I'm just so thankful for the body of Christ here, and again, I will, December 5th, I'm gonna do that. That's gonna be about you, specifically. Um, so thankful for the body of Christ and Hosanna and all the people through the years, the body that's present now and online and how all this is changing, I'm so grateful. And uh, thankful for the staff, the staffs that we've had over the years that have just been foundational to everything. 
and now the staff that you have, and with uh, Nathan as the, the under shepherd of Jesus Christ to minister to the flock, I don't think you can do any better. Let's stand. So I pray for God's blessing, his encouragement, the richness of his grace in your life to abound, that is to go beyond your life to others. Our lives are not such that we're just all about us individually, but as we love one another, and the world sees that we know Christ because of our love one for another, and we reach other people through Christ. I wanna close with this. If you're here or you're online, and you're, you're looking at me right now and thinking, I get some of this, but not all of it. I've gone to church. Me, I was an agnostic, I never did. I don't care what your background is or what your sin is or sins or whatever the spirit you grew up with or where you're at. If you commit your life to Jesus Christ right now, you will be saved. If you get hit by a truck tomorrow, you're gonna see the face of God Almighty and he's gonna say, welcome. If you don't, the destiny you're already on, you don't have to work hard at it, you're gonna to go to hell. When you reject the Savior who's given you so much, you insist on trying to get good enough to get to heaven. You won't, you can't. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Heaven will have no sin. It's like somebody, you know, they, they rob a bank and they say, well, this is nice. yeah, but look at all the good things I've done in my life. You yeah, robbed a bank. And what it would come down to is if there was just one moment of one day where you did a sin, it's still a sin and it's not going to heaven. The reality is we got a lot more than that, right? He'll forgive you right now. Let's, let's bow our, our heads before the Lord and those on mine right now with me. Father, for those that want to know you, hear their prayers according to your word, save their souls. If you're one of these people, just between you and the Lord right now, pray with me. Father in heaven, forgive me for all of my sins. Thank you for watching over me even when I wasn't watching over myself. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Come into my life now and save my soul. Cleanse me of all of my sin and give me a new beginning a beginning that starts with thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. Ooh, we are. <laughs> Did that. That's funny. Uh, well, I pray if you receive Christ, read the Gospel of John. Let God speak to you, and I know he will. I pray that each and every one of us in serving the Lord would recognize how much God loves you. You would recognize the price that he's paid for you and the word that he's given you. He keeps his promises. Thank you, Hosanna. God bless you.